This is a real honor. I started my professional career in this country, so it's great to be back. Um, we've heard some fantastic presentations about the National Action Plan Number 5, uh, nine great commitments. What they didn't tell you, my friends, Caroline and, and Mushiri, is this is really hard work. And Dr. Korea knows how hard this work is to trans transform the relationship between governments and citizens. So my first question to you is to understand personally your vision for open government in Kenya. Why do you want to do such hard, hard work? And you've been really, you've been involved in it as deputy president, now as president. Why? What's in it for you? What's in it for Kenya? Thank you very much, Aiden. Everybody else made a statement. I don't know why I'm the only one answering questions. <laughs> because this is open government. <laughs> no prepared statements. <laughs> well, uh, let me just, maybe by way of um, contextualizing why we are here, is that, as you have heard, the open government partnership framework was conceptualized in 2011. Kenya became a member in 2012. We were among the first countries to join this framework because of our belief in openness and running an open government. When I came into office as deputy president, I took it up as one of the deliverables of the administration that we were running. When you ask me the question, what is in it for us now? If you look at the bottom-up economic transformation agenda, it is about inclusivity. It is about people who traditionally have not been in the equation. And that is why we are saying the millions at the bottom of the pyramid who sometimes, most times, are left behind must this time round be in the frame be in the equation. And therefore, inclusivity brings an element of openness. And it is the reason why, as an administration, we want to push forward with the open government partnership, because it speaks to all the tenets that we believe in. It speaks to the issues of digitalization, it's the reason why we are digitizing now 17,000 uh, government services to democratize government information, availability of government information to citizens. And we believe that open government enhances transparency, enhances accountability, and makes, empowers citizens to be able to make decisions. Those three things are very important. Transparency inc improves trust in government. Accountability makes sure that resources meant for public good is not spent on other things. And number three, bringing citizens into the equation gives them the power to make decisions and to inform government policy. Let me take you up on one of the things that you're mentioning there. Sometimes open government and what you just described can feel very distant to the ordinary uh, Kenyan citizen, can feel very abstract. Um, one of the um, steering committee members a few years ago said, how do you make, from Nigeria, said, how do you make open government put a chicken, and chicken in every pot? How do you make open government real uh, for people so that they can feel that their lives are actually improving uh, from, from this approach to government. So maybe my specific question is, please share with us some really specific measures that your administration is taking and will take to strengthen economic governance and to ensure transparency and accountability in the management of public resources and public debt. What are the specific measures you're doing uh, for that? I have made a commitment, and you've had um, the Speaker of Senate say, we did agree that Public participation is not a sterile provision of the Constitution. It must amount to something. And it is the reason why we've been grappling as a nation 
how do we actualize public participation? We have now working on legislation, as you've heard. In a couple of months, we should now have a framework that contextualizes, creates a framework for citizens to meaningfully participate in enacting policy, enacting legislation, and every act of government that requires the public to participate in. That is number one. Number two, we have now work at the Attorney General's office, and I want to ask the civil society who are present here to work with the Attorney General as we improve three pieces of legislation. Number one, improve legislation on Evidence Act so that we can deal with matters corruption in the shortest time possible. Improve legislation on e-procurement and make government procurement open, including making sure that it is in the public domain which contracts have been awarded, for how much money, to which companies. And so that the public can judge for themselves whether they are getting value for money or they are take, being taken for a ride. I have made that commitment. The works is in the Attorney General's office. I welcome Zalendo. I welcome all the other civil society groups to participate in bringing this legislation to the fore. And I'm very happy with this framework because the civil society that is present here would have chosen to come here with Puvuzela and placards. But they have Sometimes chosen. Sometimes they might still have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they've come here to say, OK, what are the challenges that we have? How do we meaningfully contribute, institutionalize the solutions rather than panda on the problems, you know, on the challenges? How do we institutionalize solutions? How do we bring legislation? How do we create institutions? How do we put um, a policy framework in place? And you have said yourself, it's easy to pontificate about the challenges we have. Yeah. It is difficult to frame the solutions. I am very happy with open government partnership. It gives us an opportunity with the judiciary, with the legislature, with the executive, with civil society, with the private sector, to figure out how we solve problems together. And this is why I believe in this framework. Some of your, um, okay, I won't mention names, might, might think you're a heretic to be so welcoming of civil society uh, and private sector in, in, um, in, in government and in, in governments. Let's shift a little bit. Um, one, I, four of the nine um, uh, commitments have a tech element uh, to them. So let's talk about, and Kenya really is a leader in the region, maybe in the, in, the, in, in, in the continent, on matters technological. So, but tech also has, as was mentioned here, some real challenges, and misinformation was mentioned by the Speaker of, of the Senate. It also creates great opportunities to create wealth. So how is your administration harnessing these tech-driven opportunities? And how do you plan to balance those opportunities and grabbing them with mitigating the risks that come uh, with technology, as was outlined? I agree with you 100%. Technology all the way to artificial intelligence poses, gives us great opportunities, but also has a good measure of challenges. And I will give you two examples as how we are taking advantage of technology. Number one, we rolled out the Hustler Fund. 12 billion shillings in it already. 22 million Kenyans are beneficiaries. Today we have two million Kenyans every day borrowing from the Hustler Fund. It is delivered on a technology platform. It is the single government project that has no corruption because technology has provided the framework to make sure that we insulated from, just imagine if we were disputing or uh, giving out Hustler Fund using committees <laughs> at every uh, location, it would be, it would be hell, mm -hmm. it would be chaos. But look at what technology has done. It has made it seamless, 
It has made it transparent. It's made it easy. Let me also give you another example. Means testing instrument. Again, when we are giving out our university funding model, means testing instrument that is run on technology is giving us the leverage to be able to know which student can benefit from what. Let me also uh, tell you one more thing, that in our plan to deal with the challenges that face us, the demographic dividend that we have, one of the items that we are working on is how we are going to use technology to create digital jobs. As I speak to you, we have close to 120,000 young people in our TVETs and in other institutions that today monetize their digital expertise. So we are leveraging on technology to create jobs tomorrow. I will be signing an agreement with President Scholz in Germany, again, to leverage on technology to access opportunities for Kenyans to work in Germany physically or to work in Germany through a digital platform. So we are using leveraging on the digital space to create jobs, to deliver government services, as I said, with the Hustler Fund, to make sure that it helps us, uh, assist us, uh, sort out uh, challenges that we have, but also, there are challenges. Yeah. The finance bill became a, a victim of fake news, disinformation, misinformation, and unfortunately, that's what, what it is. And as has been said here correctly, while building the ecosystem to leverage on technology and the digital space for advancement, there will be challenges. It is the reason why we are discussing now with Parliament on how to enact um, regulations on AI, regulations around the digital space to make sure that the negative misinformation, disinformation, fake news does not rob us of the opportunity to use technology to drive our development because I am a great believer that technology gives us the largest opportunity for us to catch up with the rest of the world. It is the reason why I appointed a technology envoy, Mr. Thigo, who is not, unfortunately, is not here uh, because of uh, travel problems. He was coming from somewhere. He got stuck because of the situation we have. But it is the reason I also want us not to miss the opportunity. Yeah. In fact, misinformation, disinformation, fake news should not rob us of the opportunity to take advantage of the opportunity technology and artificial intelligence gives us. We do not want another opportunity to be left behind. It is an opportunity for us to develop talent around technology and AI. It is an opportunity for us to uh, develop expertise, and it is an opportunity for us not to be left behind again, as we have done in the past, that this time round, we want to be up to speed with the rest of the world in making sure that technology, AI, become part of the ecosystem, and we all benefit from it and avoid another digital or AI divide. Thank you. Um, I'm sure civil society will also say, when regulating misinformation, disinformation, please don't squeeze the space for self-expression. <laughs> um, I come to the last question. Um, you, the government of Kenya, is the current co-chair uh, of, of the Open Government Partnership. And there are 14 other African countries. We are told Zambia is thinking about coming in to the 15. So <clears throat> I have a personal self-interest type of question here. How would you address your fellow presidents, heads of state in the, uh, in, on the continent? What would you tell them about OGP in a way that would persuade them to join or to at least think about really embedding its principles in how they're relating with their governments and, and with the citizens? 
what would you tell them to persuade them to embrace this uh, principle, this approach? You see, the future, whether we like it or not, is going to be informed by technology. Technology democratizes information. Citizens today, anywhere, in any country, have the benefit of a lot of information. And with a lot of information, citizens are aware, and therefore, it is natural that going into the future, openness, because of the amount of information people have, it's not possible anymore for government to hide in this corner or that corner. And therefore, the natural thing to do is to make sure that we run an open system so that we avoid the fake news, we avoid the disinformation, we avoid the misinformation. And therefore, it is, it is only natural that we contextualize this and we take it into the future. I am a great champion, for example, of transparency and justice around climate financing. It is one of the things that I have been pushing because transparency does not just exist in um, what maybe governments are doing. It's also what big corporate institutions, multilateral development banks, you know, um, uh, many other institutions should be doing. It is the reason why I have really pushed for a just international financial system. Let me ask you, Aiden, why would one country pay 10% interest rate and another country pay 1% interest rate in the same ecosystem? Where is the fairness? Where is the justice? And those paying the most have contributed the least to the existential threat that we face as humanity of climate change. When I finish with you here, I will be going to Korogosho because of MATAS Climate Action. And I am very happy that among the first commitments in the National Action Plan is climate action. I will be going to Korogosho because Korogosho is a neighborhood here in Nairobi. <laughs> okay, in I will be going to... <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a neighborhood in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. I will be going to Korogosho, which is a neighborhood in Nairobi, because we lost 42 people to the floods. We got 22,000 households displaced in that, in that vicinity. And almost 160,000 people were displaced because we are going to begin the process of rehabilitating. We're going to be bringing on board 20,000 young people to participate in climate action, to participate in the restoration of the Nairobi River ecosystem so that we can not only have a proper uh, sanitation, we can deal with pollution, we can deal with solid waste, we can green the place, and we can build social housing on that space. Because these are victims of climate change. The swing between one extreme of uh, drought and when we are still figuring out what to do, we end in serious floods and we lose people. So I'm very happy with um, the context that this has been put in the National Action Plan, that we are focusing on climate change and we will be persuading other heads of state that climate change is an existential threat to all of us. It is time we used open government to create the necessary transparency in the international financial system. The necessary accountability by us as nations to make sure that we are accountable for the resources that are made available to us by citizens or by the international community. It is the reason why I am very open on making sure that we discuss our debt as a nation. I do not want it to be shrouded in mystery because it is not mystery because Kenyans will pay and it's good that we know should we contract, be contracting more debt 
and for what purpose. So it, it is a, an, a space that I am so open, and uh, sometimes I get myself into trouble yes. by being too open, because people say, okay, um, we want the president to come and explain to us this. I go explain. Then the next group, we want the president to come and explain. <laughs> so I keep explaining. And that is why I'm used to answering questions uh, the way you have asked me. But finally, let me say this, to congratulate this great body of people, those from government, those from the private sector, civil society, and I want to encourage them that they continue to be part of us, of the solution to our nation. It is the best thing that we can do for Kenya because this is our country. We are all stakeholders. Everybody, everybody's uh, voice matters, and we must continuously engage to make sure that we, uh, we, we, we benefit from as much information as we can and make sure that we make the right decision based on evidence and based on the correct information. Thank you. <laughs> Let me say, you, you, have connect, you have made open government partnership look really good. You've connected Korogosho with the international financial system. I don't think that's an easy thing to do. Um, so thank you so much for being willing to listen to, 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 to our questions from civil society. And I'd like to invite you to make perhaps your final remarks. Well, let me say this. Um, um, I'm ha very happy that we made a contribution from an executive side. Parliament made their contribution. The judiciary made their contribution, civil society, to the National Action Plan on Open Government because it is our collective responsibility as Kenyans to make sure that Kenya succeeds. It is not the business of the president alone, it's the business of every Kenyan for us to succeed because in that success is everybody's success. Let me also say the following, that um, as we do this, I want to assure all the stakeholders here that the government of Kenya that I run will continue to be open I have absolutely no qualms in being held to account. I, uh, I, I encourage civil society to continue tell, telling us the things we are doing wrong so that we can correct. And to occasionally... Tell you the things you're doing right. Yes. Yeah, I was waiting <laughs> for that to come. <laughs> and, and occasionally, you know, when we get things right, mm -hmm. they also tell us, this you're getting right, do it better or do it more. So that way we can, we can forge, you know, a collaboration that makes Kenya great for all of us. Let me conclude by saying, because there is a feasible, demonstrable, real trust gap between citizens and government across the globe, yeah. You know, there, there is, you know, there, there is a, a trust deficit. There is a trust gap. I want to welcome you and the people here and representatives from our friends, from the international community, to a trust summit here in Nairobi, the first one in the first quarter of next year, oh. so that we can evaluate what do we do to close the gap, the trust gap between government and citizens. Because unless we do that, it becomes difficult for government to implement uh, its plan and for citizens also to hold government to account. Thank you. So put it in your calendars, quarter one next year, Trust Summit here in Nairobi. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time and good luck in Korogosho and in all your other duties.